If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We are walking through the book of Romans. And I told you a few weeks ago that Romans 8 was probably my favorite chapter in the Word of God. Uh, this one today is just extremely exciting. If I get real excited and for some crazy reason I take off running, all right, just give me time to calm down and come back, all right? Uh, because if you cannot get excited about this passage, there is something wrong in your spiritual life. I'm just going to put it that way. Because there are so many promises. There are five promises in the Word of God which are amazing. It's amazing. Let me give you the outline, and if you have a bulletin, uh, you want to follow along with us. Uh, first, God's everlasting love. We are talking about God's everlasting love. Number one, there is no intimidation. And I realize there's five points, but I will get to them, all right? Normally we have three, but it's just the way the Scripture breaks down. Number two, there's no deprivation. No deprivation. Number three, there's no accusation. Accusation. Number four, there's no condemnation. No condemnation. And number five, there is no separation. No intimidation, no deprivation, no accusation, no condemnation, and no separation. You know, up to this point in the book of Romans, Paul has been teaching three ma major points. One is the depravity of mankind. Folks, man with God, without God is doomed. If they die in their sins, they will go to hell according to the Word of God. Number two, justification by grace through faith. Okay, you can't work your way in. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough. You can't say enough. It is grace by faith. God's riches at Christ's expense. And number three is sanctification by the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God that He is inside of us. I thank God that if we will listen to Him, we will do the right thing. Thing. Paul also spoke of God's sovereignty in Romans uh, chapter 8, which says, God proactively foreknew and predestined believers to be like His Son, then faithfully called and justified His children. God will also glorify us with new and perfect bodies so we can live in heaven with Him forever and ever. That is that glorification he is talking about in Romans chapter 8. In today's text, Paul asks four rhetorical questions. And really, he aims it at Satan himself. Okay, Satan himself. Number one, who is against us? These are rhetorical questions. Who will bring a charge against God's elect is the second one. The third one is, who is the one who condemns us? And we know that Satan. Who will separate us from the love of God? And the answer to all four questions is no one. No one can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the five promises in Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? And again, he's talking about everything that he has said so far in chapter 8 and it also could be in uh, the book of Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? Notice how he uses the word if. It's not a doubtful thing. If, and you could put the word because in there and still do the Scripture right. So because God is for us, who can be against us? And when you think about God being for us, I thought about this and I jotted down, God is for us, God is in us, and God is with us. And the Trinity describes those four things. God is for us. The Holy Spirit is in us. And Jesus' example is with us. It's not we have one thing. We have the Word of God to guide us. But we have the Trinity, God the Father, who created everything, God the Son, who died on the cross for our sins, and God the Holy Spirit, who indwells 
believers. So I am telling you, folks, there should be no intimidation in our lives. But we are intimidated. Matter of fact, the word here is fear. Okay, intimidation brings on fear. And I am telling you, Satan is the master of intimidation. He likes to talk about your past. He likes to talk about your sin today. He tries to tell you you have no future or you are not secure in Christ. And listen to me. As a child of God, we should not fear anything. The number one fear, every, every survey I've ever seen, the number one fear is death. It is death. But folks, I'm telling you, death to the Christian is graduation day. Death to the Christian, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we should fear nothing. And fear is the number one tool the devil uses against us. And we can see in Scripture how God says Satan is a defeated foe. Folks, you, you, you should not be intimidated by Satan. Again, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting stand up and shake your fist in his face, but I'm simply saying the Bible clearly speaks that God is for us. There is no power stronger than God. That's why we use the word Almighty God. Satan is powerful. He has a lot of demons working for him. But we serve an Almighty God who will take care of us. Look at 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Go with me to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, 8. Peter says this, Be sober, which means serious. Be vigilant. Be persistent. Because your adversary, the devil, he is your enemy. It's not that one that you don't get along with. It's not that one whose personality is strong. It's not that one that intimidates you. It's the devil, okay? He is our ad adversary. He is our enemy. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'll never forget going to uh, somewhere up by Eureka Springs, and that's where those tigers and everything is. And we got there about closing time. We got there late. And, and so they feed at 5 o'clock. And all at once we got out of our car and we started hearing these. Rawr, rawr. And I'm thinking, man, honey, I'm not sure we ought to go. I'm not sure we ought to see these things. And you know what they were doing? They were feeding these lions and tigers. And I'm telling you, it, it was just almost scary. And I was so glad they were all in cages. Because they are, they are a scary animal, okay? But even with that, folks, Satan is like that. He barks at you. He lies to you. He yells at you. He accuses you. He says things are, are so when they're not. And he is accuser. He is an accuser. He is a roaring lion. Now look at verse 9. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Folks, I'm telling you, these words are so important that you use in your prayer. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray this prayer. And we should not be intimidated by Satan. We shouldn't. Because God is on our side. Because God is with us. And then the rest of that verse says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He wants you to think you're the only one going through this. He wants you to think uh, and, and believe his lies. And folks, it was just like Eve. Eve's first mistake was carrying on a conversation with him in the first place. When you start talking to him and carrying on a conversation I'm telling you, he's sneaky, he's a liar, he schemes, he knows your weak points. Why? Because you tell him. You tell him. You say things out loud, you tell him. He can hear what you say, but he can't read your mind. Don't be afraid of Satan. Don't be afraid of Satan. And I'll tell you why. 
Turn to 1 John, just go back a few chapters, or go forward a few chapters. 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, John says, little children, and have overcome them. Overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Folks, my God is greater. My God controls everything. My God handles everything. My, nothing surprises our God. So we have to realize Satan does his best to intimidate us. But do not be intimidated as a child of God. The second thing, not only is there no intimidation, but there's no deprivation. Deprivation. Look at verse 32. And he who did not spare his own son... Okay, God gave His Son for us. He gave His Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Okay, Christ died for everyone. How shall we not with Him also freely give us all things? What's deprivation? He's not depriving you of anything. He's not holding out on you. You know what God did? God gave His absolute best to you. We are talking about the perfect Son of God. We are talking about a man that walked on water. We are talking about a man that healed blind men. We are talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who left glory. Can you imagine being in a perfect place and coming down to this nasty world of ours? God gave us the best. He's not holding out on you. He's not mad at you. He loved you so much that He sent His only begotten Son. He has given us all things. Everything we need, we have in God. And what, what Satan wants us to think is, well, God won't answer my prayer. God isn't going to do this. Or God and, and has all these things that He says to us. But he gave us his best. Ramona already quoted John 3.16, but I'm going to do it again, folks. For God so loved the world. He loves everyone, folks, that he gave. Now notice this. His only begotten son. He only had one son. There was only one son like him. He was the Messiah he was God in human flesh. That whosoever, or whoever, that's everyone, who believes in Him shall not perish. Folks, we will not die the second death. We will not perish as children of God, but have everlasting life. Folks, we will be in heaven forever and ever and ever. There's no deprivation there, folks. God gave His best. The third thing I want you to see, there's no intimidation, there's no deprivation, and there's no accusation. Accusation. Look at verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Folks, Satan charges us every day. Satan tries to uh, make us feel guilty every day. In this, this deal on charge, folks, it's a legal term. All right? If someone does something wrong and breaks the law, you bring a charge against them. And what God is saying and what, what Paul is saying through this Scripture is we may be accused, but the accusations will not come from God. Well, I don't know about you, but that is so uh, refreshing. That is so exciting in our lives. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we mess up. Yes, we don't always do the right thing. But I am telling you, God is there for us. God is there with us. God is inside us. And He does not make accusations. And, and, and so many times, folks, uh, Satan's charge, when you, when you look at what Satan tells you, 
We may be guilty of what he says, but you have to remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Even as Christians, he can, he can clean our slate. We can cry out to God. We can ask for forgiveness. And we can tell God we're sorry, and he cleans the slate. And folks, the same thing happens at the point of salvation. When you're about to uh, ask Christ to come into your life and you ask for forgiveness of your sins, everything you have done in the past, and I'm telling you, there is not a board big enough behind me to write all the things I did the first 22 years of my life. And he just takes that marker and he just erases every sin. And the Bible says in Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, he forgives us our sin. You know what Satan wants to do? He wants us to live in guilt. In guilt. Oh folks, we've all done it. We've all done this. I know I have done it many times. We ask God to forgive us, us of something and then Later on, we ask Him to do it again. The same sin. Then later on, we ask Him to do it again. And do you know what God says the second and the third time? I've already forgiven you. That sin is under the blood. Oh folks, Satan will accuse us. He will beat us down. He will lie to us. He will make us feel terrible. But I am telling you, God forgives sin. All we have to do is repent. And we know what repentance is, God. It's be feeling sorry. It's, it's being sorry that you sinned. Repentance is like we have gone in one direction and away from God and it's turning around and going back towards God. Satan accuses us, but God forgives us. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. Look at this with me. Revelation 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. Okay, we're talking about the end times here, folks. Jesus is coming again for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. What did he... I, I mean, Satan accused Job. You know, he came up to Job, and, and the Bible says in Job 1, he was a righteous man. He stayed away from evil. He wasn't perfect, but he was righteous. But, but Satan told a God, if you'll just take your hand off of him, he will curse you. And folks... That's what Satan does. That's his job. That's his job is to accuse folks. And folks, we don't need to listen to the accusations. We need to stay focused on God. We need to stay focused on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. Notice the three things uh, the writer uh, points out in Revelation. By the word of our testimony. You know, you know what you need to tell Satan? I'm a child of the king. Get away from me. Quit messing with me. My daddy can beat your daddy up. I'm telling you folks, it's saying... We have our testimony. Say it out loud. Say it strong. And then it says, uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' blood, folks, paid for our sin. Paid for our sin. It's forgiveness. He loved us so much. Jesus even said on the cross, Father, forgive them. And if Jesus forgives folks, that have sinned. We know God forgives us of sin. So don't rehash it and rehash it. Get away from sin. 
Get as far away from sin as you can. And then it says, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. Folks, there were many folks in this day, in this age, that died for the cause of Christ. They would not, they would not cave in. They would not curse uh, Jesus Christ or curse God. Nero uh, uh, was just a, a terrible king. One thing he liked to do is he'd like to take Christians and pour oil all over them and, and wrap them around a pole and, and light them up. That is, that's the kind of things, folks, uh, Satan would do. But God, even, and folks, I believe this with all my heart, God gives us dying grace. And he's saying here, these are the things that we need to do. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Oh, folks, isn't that not a description of our world today? It's ramping up, folks. It's getting crazy here. Why? Because Jesus is about to come. He is attacking everything. The, our fi moral fiber. He is attacking the church. He is attacking families. He is attacking children. He is attacking, attacking everything that we see. Why? Because he knows, even he senses that he doesn't have much time left. So what do we need to do, folks? We need to stay loyal to the end. We need to keep falling in love with Jesus and keep serving in God and keep saying, it doesn't matter what's going to come my way. I will not cower. I will not quit. I will not give up. I will not deny my Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that there's no intimidation, there's no deprivations, and there's no accusations, and there is no condemnation. I love this. I love this. Look at verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Man, that's a mouthful for one verse. Who is it that condemns? Folks, we know it is Satan, but it is Christ who died. Folks, Satan hadn't died for anybody. Satan doesn't care about your family. He doesn't care about your life. He doesn't care about anything about you. He just wants you to go to hell with him, and that would sat satisfy him. It is Christ who died, and we know it, Calvary. And is risen. We're not serving a statue on a mantle, folks. We are serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are serving a God that wants to be every bit a part of our lives. We serve a God who answers prayers and hears every one of our prayers. We need to understand there is no condemnation in Christ who is even at the right hand of God, and we know that's where He is, and makes intercession for us. Folks, he prays for you. Jesus prays for you according to the Word of God. Jesus listens to your prayers. Jesus wants what's best for you. Jesus wants God's will to, be, to happen in your life. Jesus wants that for you. So folks, he is not condemning anyone. He is loving us. He is encouraging us. He is watching us over us. Look at Romans 8. Just turn back one page. Romans 8, verse 1. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're either walking in the flesh or we're walking in the Spirit. And we as Christians need to walk in the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Do you realize you don't have to sin? You don't have to sin. Jesus and God has made you free for what, was, uh, what, for what the law could not do in that it was weak. 
through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful flesh on account of sin. Oh, folks, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He will not condemn you. Matter of fact, if you were in the court of law, he would slam the gavel down and say, not guilty. Your debt has been paid. But let's say I paid in full. Oh, I love the song, Steve. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I own. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. Oh, folks, there's no condemnation with God in Jesus. And then the last thing, and I love how the writing goes here, because God, through the Holy Spirit, spoke to Paul, and he, I, he saved the best one for last. The best one for last. There is no separation. No separation. Look at verse 35. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? The question is asked, the last one, is there anyone, anyone, or anything take away my salvation? Is there anything that can do that? And folks, the answer is no. There is nothing. And we call it security of the believer. Once saved, truly saved, always saved. And I'll show you two scriptures here that makes this as plain as day. There are a lot of folks and a lot of people that believe otherwise. But I'm telling you, you are, you are in cement with God. You know, nothing's going to take. And really, the best illustration I have is when Christ comes into your life, okay, in the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, God takes you and He convicts you of sin. Jesus Christ dies for you. And He puts His hand around you. And Jesus puts His hand around you. And the third thing is, He wraps that in the Holy Spirit. When you are truly saved. And to get to you, I'm telling you, you'd have to break the bound of, of the Holy Spirit. You'd have to take off the hand of Jesus and take off the hand of God. And folks, there's nothing more powerful than God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You are saved forever. Look what it says. For your sake we are killed all the day long and accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Why would he throw that in there? Same thing, folks, because of the Roman days, because of the Roman emperors. They died for the cause of Christ. And I'm telling you, the closer we get to Jesus' coming, Folks, persecution is going to get harder and harder and harder. There are already missionaries in third world countries that die for the cause of Christ. There are missionaries who smuggle in Bibles and try to give away a copy of the Word of God. And if, they, if they get caught, they die for the cause of Christ. So he's saying, even in death, you are mine. You are mine. Now look at verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Folks, we are more than conquerors. That's talking about super conquerors. That's talking about you can overcome anything in your life with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They are in you. They are with you. They are for you. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, how plain can it be? Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Christ Jesus. And you know what? 
it says we are conquerors. We are overcomers. And listen to this. God does not give us an overcoming life. He doesn't give us... What you're saying is God favors people. He favors some and doesn't favor others. He doesn't give us an overcoming life. He gives us life as we overcome. Oh, folks, we're all going to go through tests. We're all going to go through trials. We're all going to go through tough situations in our life. But we can be overcomers through Jesus Christ our Lord. John chapter 10, John chapter 10, the last verse, and I'm done. John 10, verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Folks, God knows who's saved and who isn't. God knows who's His and who isn't. And if you're here today and you are not born again, if you have never invited Christ into your life, you can do that today. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. What's the word never? We know what that means. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's twice he has said that. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Folks, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ our Lord. We can lay our head on the pillow at night and sleep well because... Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. I pray that you understand today that there is no intimidation, there's no deprivation, there's no accusation, there's no condemnation, and there is no separation with God. Father, thank You for the day. And God, I thank You for this wonderful passage of Scripture. God, I thank You for these five promises that you brought to us. And God, I pray that we would understand we have these promises and you have never broken a promise. Never. Your word is yes, it is right, it is amen. So God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today they would invite you into their life. And God, I pray for the Christian. Lord, I know sometimes Christians get down and Christians feel guilty and I know Satan just is all over, folks. And God, I pray that they would understand who they are in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that they would just repent of their sin. That they would just pray to You. That they would just start over. God, You will erase the board. You will let them start again. Thank You for being that kind of God. And Lord, I pray for those that maybe need to follow the Lord in baptism or Join this church by letter or baptism. God, would you just speak to them today? Thank you, thank you, thank you that you have given us everlasting life. Thank you that your love is everlasting. And thank you that we're going to live forever with you. God, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.